Well, I think uh, it's time to get started. Please uh, be seated um, at your early convenience. Um, welcome to our fr Friday colloquium. Uh, thanks for joining us. And my name is Sha Wen Wang, for those of you who do not know me. Uh, I'm a professor of geography and geographic information science. I'm running um, the CyberGS Center, hosted here at NCS, and also leading the NCS Earth and Environment theme. Um, with great pleasure and honor, uh, I'm introducing our today's speaker, Dr. Professor Forrest Masters uh, from University of Florida. He um, is a professor of the School of uh, Sustainable Infrastructure and Environment there. He got all his degrees from University of Florida. I chatted with him why he did that, and he actually grew up also from Florida. Um, so his loyalty to Gators Nation is uh, tremendous. Um, and you will soon know why, because uh, the work he does is so fascinating. It's about a hurricane and ha hazards uh, impact on, on the environment. That's perhaps one of the best places to conduct this kind of work. Um, Forrest is a young scientist by looking and by, uh, by age, but uh, he's already had a uh, very distinguished career, uh, received many awards, uh, for instance, uh, an SF career awardee and um, coordinating community-wide activities and the running national facilities. So, um, and also he's uh, now um, delivering university administration work. He's associate dean for the College of uh, Engineering there for research and the facilities. So we're very pleased to, uh, to have Forrest here share his work on, uh, you know, hurricane and uh, the boundary layer, what I was reading his work about and uh, chatting with him you could actually chase hurricanes as we would do here, chasing tornadoes. And uh, it would be as dangerous as, as tornadoes. And he described uh, he could drive in the speed of over 100 miles, try to beat in the boundary of hurricanes uh, before hurricanes arrive to, to certain locations. So that was just like uh, something I usually expect from movies, uh, but actually happened to him. So uh, this is going to be a very fascinating talk. and. Uh, Again, please join me to welcome uh, Dr. Masters on the stage. Thank you so much. <laughs> so good morning, everyone. I, I assume everybody in the back can hear me okay? Okay, great. Uh, it's a tremendous pleasure to be here today. I want to just thank everybody that's been so hospitable. Um, you get up to a big, busy place like this, and you expect to see somebody for a little bit, have a, a brief conversation, and move on. But um, everybody's been fantastic. So Frank and Amanda, really appreciate it. Um, Bill, everybody else that's, that's made it possible for me to be here today. Um, <clears throat> so today I want to talk to you um, ostensibly about windstorm impacts, but I, I think rooted in what I want to discuss is a much deeper message for the civil engineering field and for all the other disciplines that we work with. And really it's talking about our future as a profession and what we're doing. Um, and that perspective stems um, in part because of the work that I do. I've spent a, a career doing high risk, high reward work. Um, working at hurricane landfall and, and, and difficult conditions, conducting experiments to building machines to replicate their effects back in a, in a controlled setting in a laboratory. Um, but about a year ago, as um, was mentioned, I, I shifted uh, my jobs and I started, I, I went up and I'm in the dean's office now and I, I now help manage the research programs for our college, which is sort of similar in size to, to you guys. It's a big program. And so I spend a lot of time working with people from every different discipline. And it's really evident to me that civil has a, a lot of headroom left in terms of our research. So I'll talk about that. So technology will appear sort of in two places. One, in the work that I'm working on. And two, I'll make some more general comments. So we talk about hurricanes. Um, there are many different people that come together to understand hurricanes and their effect on the built and natural environment. And I think it's useful to step back and look at the spatial temporal scales to see who does what. Uh, now in Florida, people think about hurricanes all the time. It's probably not something you guys give a lot of attention to. But every year we're under threat of um, hurricanes, both from the Atlantic seaboard side and the Gulf of Mexico. And so we closely watch the National Hurricane Center, which typically forecasts at the synoptic scale. These are events that can last weeks, even a month, um, span hundreds of, squares, uh, hundreds of square miles. And meteorologists also do a lot of work to forecast winds in the impacted region. So as an entire storm moves through, they're issuing predictions. Um, 
And wind engineering sort of gets involved at this level because ultimately when you look at performance of um, buildings, we're not looking at the performance of a building, we're looking at a performance of a large class of buildings spread out over an area. Um, but in engineering, we are really focused on the small scale effects of turbulence on loads on buildings. And so understanding how the background turbulence as it affects past the structure and how that causes flow distortions around the building, how those interplay to cause peak loads on buildings or cause wind sensitive structures to respond um, and interact with the wind. And kind of eclipsing this whole thing is this area of catastrophe modeling, which you know, was, was a small industry 20 years ago, which is a very large industry now. So when you pay your insurance premium on your house, you know, often the rate setting is done using these types of models. So there's a lot of people that get involved, and there are a lot of other fields that I don't have on here. I mean, a GIS is a great example of a field that uh, heavily underpins this work. So if you're in the business of studying hurricanes, uh, there's a, a lot of uncertainties that you really have to come to grips with to really make rational assessments about what are reasonable levels of, of performance. So does anybody, everybody recognize this storm? Anybody from Louisiana or from the south? If you did, you would. This is Hurricane Katrina. Now, at this time, Hurricane Katrina is five or six hours away from making landfall. No, no damage has happened. Nobody's died over land. I mean, for this one brief moment, it's this beautiful, natural event. But in five or six hours, it's going to change. So, you know, the, the trade winds push these storms. They reach the point of recurvature. Typically, they're right around the strongest at that point. So that's the case here. But as the storm transitions from water over land, it will actually undergo its most complex phase of its life cycle. So hurricanes are like big Carnot engines. They require a, supp a supply of moisture and heat. And when they go over land, they lose that. They encounter, encounter cold river runoff. Um, the dry air often gets entrained in the storm. It's a very complex um, system as it's making landfall. And if that wasn't complicated enough, of course, looking at the actual loads on a building and looking at the wetting of the facade is an immensely complicated problem. It spans bluff body aerodynamics, um, where here you're taking you know, a very simplified prismatic structure and you're dropping it in a turbulent boundary layer flow and you're trying to make sense of this. And in, even today with all the computational capabilities we have, we still can't get reliable um, and accurate measurements of peak loads on a building system like this. Introduce rain, the problem is way more complicated. <clears throat> so having, you know, uh, if you look at uh, rain, uh, the drop size distribution is really critical to determine the wetting because the rain is actually carried by its own inertia into the building. It's a very complicated problem. So post-event, um, it's a challenge. Engineers, insurers, FEMA, uh, many different stakeholder groups go in the field post-mortem and they try to make sense of what happened. And we, we typically can't watch this process unfold uh, we have to come back and forensically assess the situation. Okay, so you, you're seeing now the intersection of all these uncertainties, right? There's the weather event, there's the structural performance. Um, there's another layer that's really a critical piece of the puzzle. Um, if you study severe weather, you're used to seeing lots of photos like this over the years. So you look at this and what do you immediately think? What happened? So here we are, this is a Hurricane Charlie, it's a Category 4 storm, struck Boquilla, Boquilla Island, probably had gusts of 140 miles per hour. And we see two buildings, one in the background which is standing intact, one in the foreground which is completely destroyed. Well, what could that be? Most people would jump right to, well, it's a wind streak, or a tornado, or a microburst. In fact, it's none of these things. What you're looking at are two different areas of construction. So the mobile home in the back was built to the post-1994 standard, which in theory should be equivalent to a site-built home based on the, that, the HUD standard that it was being used. The one in the front was built in 1976, when there really were no standards in place. So the code era and the standards that were used to guide construction also play a role. So it's a pretty complicated problem. So as a result, and particularly um, in the late 80s, early 90s, because of Hurricanes Hugo and Andrew, uh, when engineering, um, really kind of rose up and said we have to look at this in more detail. So I, I got involved in the late 90s with this and uh, like many of you that are here I was a grad student in the early 2000s and this kind of led to a career where I've done a number of things but working at landfall and storms and, and building machines to replicate their effects. And so I've um, done many experiments over the years. Um, I've, I've you can watch this presentation later. I've sprinkled in publications later if you want more context to see some of the things we're doing. But 
some of this work, it takes us directly in the path of, of landfalls. We take fleets of, fleets of instrumented towers like the ones you see here, and we intercept the storm, and we take measurements. I've been in um, over 25 named storms. Uh, most of the ones you've seen on TV, I've, uh, you know, I've been in. And it allows us to go in and actually characterize the, the boundary layer, the lowest portion of the Earth's atmosphere. Here's a quick little video, kind of the early, early days. So this is um, uh, during Hurricane Isabel, which is a Cape Verde storm, very well behaved, that came into the Outer Banks. That's, that's me when I was a grad student, a little bit thinner. Um, but uh, you can see uh, we're disconnecting the tow vehicle here. It's basically a ruggedized system. Um, so this thing is, this, this, uh, this equipment's been fully designed to withstand up to a 200 mile per hour gust. Um, both static loads and also dynamic response characteristics have been factored in. But the basic idea is that <clears throat> uh, we attach sensors to this piece of equipment and allows us to go in, like these right here, these are anemometers. It allows us to go in and take real-time measurements as the storm passes through. And this is critical because when we look at loads on buildings or we look at windborne debris generation or water ingress on the building envelope, Understanding the nature of the turbulence is critical to understanding the fluctuating loads that act on the building because there's a level of admittance between the two. And so you can see the, see the equipment. So every time you see a storm now, you can think there's this group from UF and some other universities that go out and take these measurements like this. We've done the same thing in, in tornadoes um, and sent teams out on the, the team out on the Vortex 2 project, primarily to capture um, wind driven rain information. We've also worked closely with the radar community, the Doppler on wheels uh, groups, and really what we're doing there is learning how to take wind speeds that have been measured aloft using remote sensing capabilities and convert that to um, surface wind speeds. With the end goal of moving away from these in-situ observations that we take now to actually be able to, to use multi-Doppler synthesis so you can take a very um, detailed, produce detailed wind field maps something on the order of maybe every 100 meters, on the order of 10 seconds to a minute, actually getting wind speed measurements, so you can reconstruct the sequence of events. This work has also taken us in the field to um, measure loads on buildings. So unlike the seismic community, we have some advanced notice. So it gives us a, a, a window of time where we can go in and instrument real homes like the one you've seen here with pressure sensors so that we can record the passage of, uh, pr record pressure on the building during the passage of the storm. So this is a house in, um, in uh, Hurricane Ivan. You can see some windborne debris flying in there, about to fly out. And <clears throat> when it's all said and done, we have these detailed measurements that we can then use to go back into the wind tunnel. Um, and we've done, we, for NSF, we've done experiments, or we've done a project where we did a multi-tunnel study and do comparisons um, of real homes, really complex shapes, looking at these types of things. So the last piece of the puzzle um, in terms of the experimental work we do um, is along the lines of full-scale testing. So a really interesting thing has, ha you know, has happened in the last 10 years. There's been a lot of attention, in particular this university, on seismic engineering. Um, and we all know that seismic engineers use the shake table. I think most of us know that you know, wave flumes and wave tank facilities are used for coastal engineering problems, ranging from littoral type applications to actually looking at even loads on buildings. Um, if you're in the blast impact side, uh, using a shock tube. So what, what have wind engineers been using? And we've developed a class of systems that's sort of the analog to this, and I've been instrumental in a few of these. Uh, this is a system I built at UF. It was a 2,800 horsepower outdoor windstorm simulator that could simulate buffeting loads and also wind-driven rain on building systems. And, uh, you know, the thing about research, and I'm really talking to the students here, is you start out with this grand idea of what you're going to do, and then it becomes something completely different. And that's what happened here. So I'd love to tell you we did all this like, really amazing research, and we did some cool things I'll show you in a second, but this, this uh, particular system got a lot of attention, and we had you know, everybody from the Mythbusters coming out to film with this thing, to CNN and whatnot. But um, I'll, I'll stray away from the structural engineering application to tell you about a couple of things we did that were, I think were, to my mind, even way more interesting than um, what we would have done for that. Um, we got to work across campus in particular, got to work with, uh, basically urban landscaping. So in, in uh, Florida and places on the coast, uh, it's a, you know, the, the threat of hurricanes can mean significant loss of, um, 
of landscaping throughout the area um, when a storm comes through. And so we worked with um, an arboriculturist who had grown genetically identical trees, looking at pruning techniques and root ball deaths, and more or less ran a structural engineering experiment. That tree is instrumented with 35 different sensors, ranging from strain gauge measurements to accelerometry. And we're able to load these things under forced oscillations to see how they respond and sort of do this uh, parametrically. Um, <clears throat> so you can see all the wires going up to the strain gauges and whatnot. And so that was a, that was a, really, um, that was a really interesting project that we did. You see the root plate coming up. Another that we got involved with uh, was related to social psychology. So I worked pretty closely um, to study how people well, my, my hypothesis was that people overpredict these events. I'd, I'd actually, you know, I'd been in storms. I'd talked to people. And a little anecdote, I, I remember very clearly after Hurricane Charlie, I came up to this community that had been almost completely destroyed. And I saw this older gentleman sitting outside, sitting in a lawn chair or a bucket or something. And I, and I came up to him and I said, sir, you know, what, what happened? What do you think happened? And he looked at me and he said, well, you know, we got 214 mile per hour winds. And I said, wow, okay. And, you know, when you're in a situation like that, you don't try to really have discuss these kind of things with people. They just, just lost everything you had, right? Really sad. But as I left and I drove away, I, I thought to myself, well, why, why did he think the winds were so high? And, and why 214 miles per hour? You know, and I thought about all the other stories that I heard, been in the field talking to people, and I thought, you know what, people probably overpredict. They're in these things, and they think they've been in a Category 4, but in fact, it's more like tropical storm force winds. So I said, let's, let's put this to the test. And so when a research associate came to me and said, hey, I'm looking for something to do, and I said, I got an idea, something I wanted to dust off. And so we did an experiment where we subjected people after we'd given them surveys to, to get a sense of their risk aversion and demographics and all that. But we subjected people to different levels of wind speed and rain intensities um, and while they were in there, we asked them, you know, what's the wind speed? Of course, we knew they didn't. And also what your uh, sense of risk was on a 0 to 10 scale. So I, it's, look, it's a little sensational. It's kind of fun to laugh at. But the reality is what, what we found was, in fact, the hypothesis was true, is that people do overpredict. And if you do the appropriate scaling, what you would see is that the average person might overpredict by two Saffir Simpson categories of wind speed, which is a big deal. I mean, that's going to inform your decision making whether or not you're going to retrofit your home, or are you going to evacuate, or are you going to shadow evacuate, which means when you leave when you're not supposed to. And so it gave us, for the first time, a real baseline. We'd moved away from these sort of semantic threshold type tests that had been done for wind comfort studies and gave us something to work with. So just to give you an idea of the power of some of these tools, it's not all about structural engineering. Um, the largest of these is the uh, Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety. It's a 30 megawatt wind tunnel. I think that could power about 9,000 homes. It's in South Carolina. Has anybody seen this facility before? Okay. I'll just play the video. Watch. Here we have two houses. The one on the left, the only difference is about $3,000 worth of additional retrofits. They never found the grad student, but you know, we, uh, everybody learned a lot from that. So we, we've worked with that program extensively, designed their wind-driven rain system, did the early testing. Let me switch to the NERI network very quickly. This is another project we're involved with right now, uh, working very closely. And there's a constellation of programs across the country. This is the, the, the program that followed NICE. Uh, we're one of them. There's two wind engineering facilities. Um, I'm joined by my colleagues here, Jennifer, David, Trey, and Kurt. Jennifer got her PhD right here. Um, that manage this program. And for our NCSA folks, I wanted to point out this is really not just an experimental facility. It's really a cyber physical testing facility. So you can see our high performance computing center and our lab there. Um, they're completely fully integrated. There's a 10 GB pipe that connects the two facilities. You can actually run the supercomputing center in conjunction with your experiments. And I'll talk more about that. Um, but our experimental facility, we have five different resources that we use. Um, we have systems like this. We call it the MALS. Sounds a little sensational, but it's the multi-axis wind load simulator. And the basic principle of this is we can apply out-of-plane loads on building systems in very, very extreme loads, um, the type of loads that are commensurate to what you might see on a skyscraper in a Category 5 hurricane or an EF5 tornado if it impacted a low-rise building. Um, it's a 
it's a you know it's a fully controllable system. We have an 1800 horsepower diesel prime mover, and we have five dampers, which are valves effectively. One of which is a is a a very fast acting um, louver damper system. Um, think about the hydraulics here in your facilities as kind of equivalent to that. A little a little bit different. This system is actually entirely analog. Um, operates uh, very quickly, um, but we can do a number of different things by turning one valve configuration, we can apply positive time varying pressures. If we turn it the other way, we can do negative pressures. This allows us to actually go in and replay dynamic loads on building systems to see how it performs. And we can accommodate very large test specimens. We can change the boundary conditions um, and take all the measurements you might think you would take from strain to we use, we use photogrammetry systems, uh, platform load cells to take measure forces, et cetera. And um, the other neat part about this system is that we can shut off the pressure chamber entirely, and we have a high-speed wind tunnel where we can generate winds in excess of 230 miles per hour. Now, this is an old video. If you looked at the system now, it looks a lot nicer, but I still love it because it's just fun to watch. But um, this is a, we're doing some threshold testing on a roof tile system, and uh, what you can see here is we're steadily increasing the wind speeds. Um, and what this allows us to do is look at the fixity conditions. So we do this a couple different ways. Um, this is a truly destructive test, so there's no sensing happening. In just a second, you'll see what happens. That's it. So it allows us to actually go in and understand uh, what the threshold of flight would be for these types of systems. But we do lots of things. We build replicas of models and measure pressures. We put six-axis loads to L cells in. One of the other interesting facilities is our, our wind tunnel. Um, this is truly a cyber-physical facility. Now, if you've not seen a wind tunnel before, the basic principle is you have you create a pressure gradient across the tunnel. Uh, you generate a lot of wind. You straighten it out. You take out the turbulence with honeycombs and screens. This air, which in theory should be very uniform, very low turbulence density, passes through a few spires, which promotes mixing. And that air moves across, across this roughness element grid here. And then when it reaches the turntable, you grow a boundary layer. And you can see how the mean velocity increases with height. That's one of maybe eight or 10 different aerodynamic properties we look at to achieve similitude. So in a traditional tunnel, it would look like this. This is RWDI, which is one of the best uh, wind tunnel engineering groups in the world. Uh, the group that did the Burj uh, Khalifa, uh, among many other landmark structures. But this is what a typical facility looks like, so you can see all the roughness elements. Well, we took this to uh, a different level. We, we thought, what if we could go in and build a multi-stage system using active flow control techniques to generate the boundary layer? And then what if we could actually tune the terrain to have very price, precise control of the flow over the systems? And so what that led us to is developing a system we call the Terraformer. And it consists of over 1,100 integrated stepper motor drives we control simultaneously. It's quite a challenge you know, getting this built and actually having this thing work, as you, as you might imagine. But um, we do that with 48 RS-45 communication buses. But it gives us very precise control. Now, when I was talking to RWI, I realized, you know, OK, achieving different uh, terrain conditions is something that looks pretty feasible. But what about geometric scale? What if you have a 1 to 100 or you have a 1 to 400 scale model? How, do you, how would you dial that up? And that's what led us to come up with a design like this, which allowed us to use one actuator to get two degrees of freedom. So by spinning a single element up in place, if I did one revolution, it only changes a millimeter in height, which is almost imperceptible for this type of thing. Um, but by changing it 90 degrees, I completely change the drag profile, the pressure drag on the element, the frontal area. And so it gives me very precise control to get a much wider range. And I won't jump into all these different cases, but we're really getting unprecedented control of a wind tunnel now. Uh, this is a, a typical, how many, how many atmospheric scientists do we have in the room? We got a couple? Okay. So if, you, if, you, if you're a boundary layer person, you'll love this kind of stuff. If you're not, you're like, okay, next slide, please. But uh, you know, it gives us, this is the easiest possible case to go in and take these types of measurements, but this has actually given us the ability to go in and look at all the different regions, the inner and outer layers, the urban canopy layers. This is where the damaging wind happens, and we can control this. So we can take that system within 90 seconds, we can dial up any possible terrain conditions. We've really created the first high throughput facility and allows us to look at a wide range of issues, and we're really un overturning some fundamental ideas. Here's a simple one. Wind does not behave in a Gaussian manner as the roughness picks up, the surface roughness picks up. This has been an assumption we've applied since the 1950s. 
and it makes a difference. So when we go to the AEC-7 and we calculate loads, we're now seeing, because we can, between the field measurements, the FCMP data, and the wind tunnel measurements, we're really beginning to get a picture of this, and I don't have time to get into it, but, but we can explain why now, because of the sweeps and ejections that are in the flow. And this ultimately allows us to give us this, this wide, wide range of possibility to go um, characterize these flow. Okay, that's not really why I built the system. I had this idea when I was a grad student, just like you guys out there, um, I started out in uh, stochastic mechanics and generating random fields. And I thought, wouldn't it be interesting if we could generate random terrains where we control the spectra, we control the probabilistic content of these fields, right, and seed it with new phases, and then in turn take measurements downwind to see how that responds. And so the next step we're going to take is can we figure out what the functional relationship is between the morphometric properties of the upwind terrain and the turbulence characteristics? And if we could do that, if we can establish proof of concept, then that creates a pathway to taking remote sensing capabilities and do this globally. So stay tuned. We're going to start that in the spring. Um, and just a quick little video. You can see the system. Let me scroll ahead a little bit. So you can see it in operation. This is something that NSF came Okay, we didn't hang a grad student from a gantry, it's a drone uh, flying around taking the images. But you can see the system, we're dialing up a heterogeneous terrain, that's what it looks like. It's really, if I let it play, you're going to fall asleep, it's a little mesmerizing. But uh, you get the idea. And so, in this particular instance, that's a field. All right, I want to switch away from my research for a second, though, now. And I want to talk about what we did for NARI. And specifically, I want to talk about two aspects of the science plan that, that we produced. Um, and so there are many different topics which probably would resonate with many of you, particularly in structural um, engineering. I know we have at least one architect here with us today, MIDS building envelope. But I'm going to focus on two. I want to talk about advancing computational wind engineering and reducing our reliance on physical testing. So I, I'm going to lay my cards on the table. I, I really do think far ahead. I think everything I ever read in a hard science fiction book as a kid is probably going to happen in the next 100 years. So many amazing things that are going on right now. And when I think about what structural engineering can do, and maybe through multi-physics modeling, other approaches can do, I really think in 100 years, we're going to be a lot less reliant on uh, physical testing. We'll be able to do things computationally, we, we hope. And so we'll talk about that and with the role of cyber physical testing. Then also talking about advancing automation design of hazard resistant infrastructure. This is the thing that nobody seems to be talking about, and we need to elevate the discussion, I believe. So I want to just kind of roll back in time. Now, there's been a lot of work done looking at resilience study, community resilience study, trying to really understand how community function interplays with building performance, OK? I'm not going to talk about that. I want to go back to right around maybe 2005 to 2008. We had a tremendous amount of windstorms that came through. And the whole world was thinking about, well, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And there are a number of roadmaps that, that rolled out. And, and if you look at these roadmaps, if you can see it, you can, these are the kind of the words that you would see. And as a result, guys like me, they, we get called, well, what's he doing? Well, he's a mitigation guy. I don't really know what that means, but you know, that's, that's how we got looked at. But think about this. I mean, 2005, it was, a, it was just a completely different world, right? Uh, iPhone came out in 2007. I mean, think how common that is to see technology like that today. Hinton produced the backpropagation technique, which underpins you know, deep belief networks. I mean, that's just changed everything. DARPA did his robotics challenge. I mean, 2005, if I said to you we're going to be test driving autonomous vehicles on the interstate, you'd have, you'd have said, well, who's this guy? Right? So I think the, the real question that I want to ask is, you know, where does technology fit into the long-term research objectives to reduce measurable reductions in the loss of life and property in, in the context of wind engineering? And I, guess, and I guess what I'm really trying to tell you is, did you, did you see all the stuff that I've done? I've been there. I've been living, breathing, eating wind engineering now for the last 12 years from all sides and all disciplines. And I think there's a bigger discussion to be had about the state of technology and how fast it's advancing. And I think ultimately that might give us the end run on some of these problems because we have really honed our tools. But if you look at the impacts, they're really not decreasing as much as we would like or at all. So a couple of points you made there. Um, let's talk about technology and the state of technology. There's something called the Trillion uh, Sensors uh, Roadmap. Has anybody heard of this before? It's a really interesting uh, program. But basically, they're looking at the absorption of sensors and technologies, you know, your smartphone, tablets, things like that. All right. 
So 2007, kind of leading up to that, right, you, you, you started seeing stuff get cheaper, like Acceleron or airbags and yada, 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 right? 2007, when the iPhone came out, you started seeing more sensors going in phones. Uh, 2012, it's close to three and a half billion. And the projection is by 2022, there'll be more than a trillion sensors in play. How do we capitalize on that? Now, the sensors are really only sort of one half of the puzzle to me. Uh, you probably also heard about the Internet of Things. You know, so it was a very broad term of art. But for people that actually work on true Internet of Things, they often use this sort of tree example where you think of, you know, when you buy the Samsung hub for your house, we're talking about the services that are offered. But electrical engineers would study the hardware aspect of this, looking at the componentry to make it possible. And this is getting quite advanced, as you know, from your phone. And you've barely begun to see the things that are going to come out with terahertz and everything else. Right? So this is rapidly advancing. I think one of the biggest changes to come, the thing that's really going to turn our discipline as a whole, and I don't mean just researchers, I mean practitioners, everybody that calls themselves a civil engineer, it's really going to affect their lives, is the introduction of augmented reality, mixed reality, cinematic reality, holography. Now, when you say holography, people think Princess Leia, right? It's, it seems far-fetched. But the reality is I'm, I'm, I'm showing you real technology here. This isn't made up. That phone with the, the, the buildings there, that's, that's real. So look, I'm, and I'm really talking to the students in the room here with this, because you're the, in the best position to, to drive change. You know, there's going to come a point in time with a current paradigm of how we do business. If, I, if we designed this building, we would pull together six, eight, ten different firms. You have this tremendous communication burden trying to sort these things out. How long will it take us to get to the point where these groups can sit at a table in an afternoon, and because they can see the building, they can work through these things, they can optimize the building, knowing that sound engineering principles are being applied to do the analysis, while they say things like, add a story, remove a story, apply a sustainability filter, and you're going to begin to see everything at their fingertips. So I encourage you to think long and hard about what that means 20 years from now when you're a practicing engineer. So we talk about enhancing our vision. I want to just drill down on a couple things. Um, so I, I'm a firm believer our tools are advancing, both in design, construction, and operating civil infrastructure and lifelines. Um, I believe that AI-based agents are going to be more commonly used um, and help us do things we couldn't do before in a much faster way. And also robotics, prefabrication, and atom manufacturing are going to be a standard tool. Again, I'm not talking about tomorrow. I'm not talking about two years from now. But over time, these things will become standard practice for us. So let me talk about the um, AI-based part first. Now, I'm going to just give you a very simple example. And I, I'm not going to get into machine learning right now or anything like that, OK? I'm going to give you a very simple example of the kind of things we can do using optimization methods. So there's many different ways to optimize buildings. Certainly, the optimality criterion or gradient-based technique is a pretty common, well-established approach. Um, it does a great job, but it's somewhat limited. Then at most applications, you can only look at serviceability of a structure. Um, we've developed a method where we're actually using meta-heuristic techniques, which I'll explain in a second, to design, uh, in this instance, a 60-story, seven-bay building. Um, and we can design it for both strength and serviceability requirements. Don't really have time to get into all the details here, but <laughs> pay, pay attention to the thing on the bottom, bottom right. You can see that it's impossible to fully enumerate all the different cases that you could ever want to look at for these types of systems. So we're reliant on optimization approaches to do that. And, you know, this is, it's a fairly straightforward procedure. Honestly, it's, it's a pretty lightweight process to do. It's not hard to implement. Um, you identify your design variables, in this case, the so-called topology, the shapes of the different sections in the, in the model. You can identify serviceability constraints, such as interstory and total drift. We can identify strength constraints. This is a steel frame building, so we're looking at load capacity ratios, or LCRs. You can develop an optimization uh, Objective, in this case, we want to minimize the weight, and you can develop a constrained function. And then from there, there are a million different methods you can choose from to solve this problem. And the, the method I'm going to show you here is kind of a mashup between particle swarm and the big bang crutch. And I'm sorry if you want to see the equations, but this paper is about to go out next week, so I didn't quite want to throw that up yet. But it's a mixed approach between the two that basically explores and then exploits the space to arrive at a solution. 
So there's many different ways to apply these. Let's just jump right to an example. So here we can see this same building, and what we're looking at is the serviceability constraints. So we're running the optimization, and you can see this drift limit is met very quickly. And uh, correspondingly, we can do the same thing for the strength side, stability side, and we can get our LCRs in place. Okay. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm just scratching the surface of the things we can do. This is simply a meta-heuristic algorithm on a moment frame still resistant structure. You know, I'm talking about cognitive computing and the bigger things that are gonna come that are really gonna change this process. And so if I really had to kind of really extrapolate, I would say high performance computing, it's ubiquitous today, right? Anybody can get an account, probably within a day you can be set up, you can be running. But as engineers, we're really fully embracing the potential of the technologies to come. So yes, people are starting to get to this point and do this. It's not just the astronomers and the quantum chemists applying these approaches, okay? But there's many other ways to, to look at this. You know, when, when you write a CFD code or you write a finite element code, you never stop and think to yourself, how is the hardware configured to run my code? You never think about that. Now, other places, they think about it a lot. For example, this is a reconfigurable computer. What it means is it doesn't really follow a von Neumann architecture. Um, it's really designed to be reconfigured using FPGAs and other tools to adapt to whatever the need is. And systems like this, they go in satellites, they go in the Mariana Trench, they go in places you can't go in and reconfigure them later to solve a particular problem. But that's just the start. Of course, quantum computing, the work that D-Wave is doing, the work that Google's doing, at the moment, it's somewhat constrained, right? If you're solving a, a quadratic unrestrained binary optimization problem, well, that's maybe your new best friend. But a lot of other problems you could not solve with that system. But over time, all these will come together. And in the very long term, you know, there's a lot of fundamental science being done now in biological computing, from biochemical to biomechanical, to in just encoding data in DNA. Very low power, tremendous potential. Um, and then, of course, people are trying to model biological systems using neuromorphic engineering. So the world is changing very quickly. Now, look, I'm not trying to scare anybody off, okay? So grad students, we're not going to make you teach a take a class on biological computing next semester. But let's, let's really expand the horizon, and let's look at those endpoints to see what we can do today. And I, I would suggest in the, in the meantime, you know, in, in the context of wind engineering, we've really got to be focusing on real-time hybrid simulation. So really taking a page out of seismic engineering's book. So there's a lot of work being done, and the premise is that you experimentally test part of a structure, and the rest is solved numerically, and these things communicate and inform each other, so you can really get a holistic analysis. We've never done this in wind. We've started the very first project, and I'm very, very pleased to tell you, it's being led by Brian Phillips, who's one of your recent graduates here who's doing it, who's working with me on this project. And so what we'll be doing is moving from the traditional model-in-the-loop approach to what we call the loop in the model. And the basic premise, let me get all these animations out of the way, is that we can put an air elastic model or we can put a model, we can morph the geometry um, in this, so it's a fully controllable model. And we can take measurements in the tunnel. Effectively, we can do the fluid structure interaction that we can't problem, we, we can solve that here, the thing we can't do on the computer today, right? And in turn, we can couple that with complementary FEA analysis so we can look at the strength uh, characteristics of that system. And then from that, we can actually iterate, we can produce candidate solution, and we can optimize that structure on the fly. The big difference between the seismic folks and us is that when we run a wind tunnel, typically our experiments run 60 or 100 times faster at full scale due to the scaling laws that we use. So it's very ideal to go in and test candidate solutions. And what that's going to drive us to is something like this, where we can go in and we can do aerodynamic optimization. In fact, we're going to start that very, very soon and also look at stiffness optimization or mass or damping optimization these types of problems. So no one's tried this before. It's done very trial and error. You go and you do a test, you go back to the architect and the engineer, dot, 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 until you converge on the solution. We're asking, can we do this in an afternoon? And we think we can. So if you're interested in this, um, we'll be working through Nary. We'll be posting data sets. You're welcome to come see what we're doing. We'd like to have you along. Okay, uh, final thought. I need to wrap up here. Um, <clears throat> So we've got that side of the house, which is really more design-oriented. The other thing that I'm paying very close attention to uh, is where robotics, prefabrication, and atom manufacturing is going. And this is a, a really interesting topic. And there's a tremendous amount of work right now to develop drone systems. And there's so many different applications. And you know, the best programs in the world at Carnegie Mellon and MIT and ETH, et cetera, right, are solving these problems. But as civil engineers, I think we need to be asking right now, what can we do? And I'm going to make that case. 
I'm going to stop pounding the table and start pounding the facts. There's a really nice report by McKinsey, which is a little bit washed out here, so maybe you can't see everything. But last fall, they went and looked at over 700 different job sectors. And they asked the question, if we took conventional technologies, technologies we get off the shelf, how far could we take it with, the, uh, with automating these processes? So you can see the different fields. So for example, the structural metal fabricators and fitters, you know, they, they believe that over 90% of that work could be automated today, which kind of makes sense when you think about what the automotive industry can do, right? And you sort of work your way down to building and an inspection. You can see architecture, construction, engineering managers, and uh, the, the yellow one, which you probably can't see on your screen, says architects and civil engineers. Okay, so it's happening. So again, when McKinsey does this report 10 years from now, all those bubbles are going to rise. In 30 years, they're going to rise further. And you know, in 100 years, all those bubbles will probably be at the top. So what are we doing about that? The other uh, piece of the puzzle really is where are the technologies today? So this is a, um, a figure from uh, Automation and Construction by a German professor, uh, Professor Bach. And basically what it looks at is the maturity of technology. And, and so pay attention to the time axis on the bottom. And, and you can see right around 2010, roughly around where we are now, we're at this point where things aren't really moving. But the best experts in this area, which interestingly enough, are not really the United States. They're almost always outside the United States, are really projecting significant growth and maturity in 20 to 30 years' time. So we've all seen this classic photo. You know, I don't know what the future is going to look like. Maybe that. You know, I don't think the whole humanoid thing is going to uh, happen anytime soon. But nonetheless, it's fun to look at. But it is happening. It is definitely happening. There is a cottage industry of people in the United States, outside the United States, that are developing technologies, particularly for masonry systems, to assemble uh, systems on site. Please, think about the tremendous potential if we could suck the uncertainty out from building infrastructure. The uncertainty that comes with people, often new people, building stuff for the first time. You know, there's all this great work that's being done now in community resilience, trying to figure it out. I, I suspect when it's all said and done, what, what, what happens? We're going to increase societal expectations for the performance of built infrastructure. How are we going to pay for that? Well, technologies like this can make that possible. They can significantly offset the cost associated with using human labor to do things. Now, there's many ethical questions that kind of come up with this, and particularly the hollowing out of the middle, particularly as a profession later on. But as civil engineers, I think we should be the one guiding this process. We should be making those decisions. And, and we should be working with programs like NCSA to chart a path uh, for managing all the cyber infrastructure and all the other things that kind of go with this. So a couple of concluding remarks. Um, I love what the community has done looking at sustainability. I love what the community has done looking at resilience. The thing that I almost hear nothing about, and I hope to hear more about, is technology, and technology is a driver to make communities more resilient, and potentially producing some end runs to reduce losses for windstorms. And I'd like to see uh, prioritization development for research and development test beds that really do focus on cyber physical research, um, with the idea that this will open up pathways to improve computational analysis. Uh, under the broad heading of cognitive computing, which I think IBM owns, but still I like it, you know, advancing our profession that our students do learn. You know, super machine learning, optimization. I think this should be, I mean, really, is there any problem in engineering we don't solve that's not about optimization, right? I'd like to see this become very widespread. And of course, a, a, attention on robotics, prefabrication, added manufacturing, as well as autonomy, which is kind of connected to the other one, too. So let's stop looking through the, through the rearview mirror. Let's look through the windshield with these topics. It's, it's the right time. So. I'm just going to finish with the final thought. You know, it's all well and good that we have ideas about things we can do. But speaking to the grad students here in the audience, I, you know, I, I suspect most of you that are here, probably early in your life, maybe middle school, high school, you realize you're a little bit different than everybody else, right? The math came a little bit easier. 
And maybe somewhere later you figure it out, maybe I'm meant to do some big things. I assure you, the fact that you're sitting in that chair in this program around these excellent people at this wonderful university, that's probably true. So what are you gonna do? We're looking to you to help create that future. So I hope in all this discussion that I've, I've given you today, you can find one or two things that might resonate with you and you can help us find our way forward. So when I acknowledge NSF, I have four projects supporting a lot of the stuff you saw. I didn't, it wasn't easy to individually attribute them, but um, as well as Oak Ridge and uh, the state of Florida and a company called Specialite, and also our students and staff. Um, in particular, I want to acknowledge Pedro Fernandez, um, who's like my grad students, worked very closely on this, and Ryan um, Catarelli, uh, two great guys, and they're working with Frank's group. Uh, really, uh, really dedicated. So, uh, you know, onward, forward, upward. Thank you. Fascinating talk first. I'm excited to travel through time back and forth over the course of the talk. So, um, we do have plenty of time for questions. Um, we need to use a microphone whenever you have questions. Raise your hands and we'll get the microphone to you. Forrest, thanks for an excellent presentation. Um, I've got two questions. Uh, one is, you showed us that with good design codes, uh, particularly this mobile home example uh, drove this home, that um, we can build structures, residential structures, that can withstand with, uh, the types of winds that we're seeing in these hurricanes. So the first question is, where are the real uh, challenges in wind engineering uh, experimentally? I know computationally there's a lot that needs to be done uh, so that we can design more resilient structures and more resilient communities. And then the second question is, uh, with regard to what you had said, the real-time hybrid simulation. I guess our con concept of real-time hybrid simulation in the earthquake field is that um, you change the structure, you apply loads to the structure, and then that's fed back into the computational simulation. And it seems like what you were doing is you would do an analysis, you get the response from the wind tunnel, and then you change your structure. So uh, if if I understand it, it's a little different concept. And I, I wanted you to comment on that as a second question, please. Sure. So, you know, with regards to the first question, which really centers on what are the big issues we face, okay? I mean, there are basic science questions we need to answer. But a lot of them, if we answer them, how much are we really going to move the needle in terms of improving computing performance? Um, so, so, Let's kind of jump to maybe some of the applied type problems and we'll skip the basic science parts. So one of the biggest problems we have today, particularly for residential infrastructure, which is what suffers most of the damage, it's not the structural skeleton failing, it's, it's the components and cladding. I think the analog would be building contents damage and seismic, right? Enormous portion of the losses that happen in a storm are attributed to cascading failures by building components blowing in, which causes adverse pressure gradients in the building, and then the building unzips, and then it's open for looters, right? So if that one component hadn't failed, none of the other consequences would have happened. Um, so this is, a, I think, a big problem with that. I just, you know, and that maybe my talk kind of uh, addressed this. I'm not really sure if we can ever fix that problem, as long as people are building things, and as long as we're not using optimal, optimized approaches to designing things to prevent construction errors from happening. And so, um, you know, the building envelope, I guess, is the direct answer to your question, but the foundational problem is that I think we need to up our game with the tools we're using to design, construct, and operate civil infrastructure and lifelines. With the second question, yeah, you, you, you hit the nail on the head, and we're sort of borrowing that tool because, frankly, it's deeply inspired by what the seismic community did. But I think the model in the loop versus the loop in the model, that air elastic model in the tunnel, we can only get out deflections. I don't know what the performance would be. And in fact, I would even use an idealized model in the tunnel, so I can't even really infer the total dynamic response of the building. But by building out the rest of the model computationally, we get a very holistic view of this, so we can look at both strength and serviceability um, in, on the fly. And so as exactly as you said, that's the idea. 
is that we do a candidate we run a candidate solution. We look at those things. We determine based on that um, configuration. First, is it permissible, right? Because if the bottom uh, column is buckling, then it's not, and that's not a, a solution that we can use, right? Or same thing for drift. Um, and that's the idea: is that we progressively learn and change. And it's this is a very complicated problem because keep in mind we have to look at wind from all directions, right? So we're going to start with some simple cases first to see what we can do and, and work our way up. So it's a, it's a different approach, but I say it's very much the exact same spirit um, that guys like you and, and uh, many other people across the country that have worked on these problems have to solve them. And, and thanks for the kind words too, by the way. Should start with that. Uh. <coughs> We have time for another question. Yeah. Uh, Forrest, thank you for coming, and I underscore Bill's comments about how uh, excellent your talk was. Uh, you showed two slides that struck my attention here, and one was the uh, wind tunnel with the terrain uh, that can vary uh, quite quickly with yep. over a thousand motors. And then a few slides later you showed, yeah, that one. A few slides later you showed the uh, urban area with the uh, high-rise buildings and I put the two, to, two together and I thought, well, are you going to measure terrain effects in the actual in situ condition in our urban areas by putting sensors on all the buildings? And if so, uh, are you or anybody else that you know of doing studies on big data across urban areas to look at terrain effects by doing so? Yeah, and, and so uh, there's a lot to cram in, so I didn't really get to talk about the uh, field deployment activities, but we've, we've had about 40 different single-family homes in the Carolinas and Florida that we've instrumented in storms. And so we've captured data on about eight of them, but those are about the only eight. <laughs> I think there's two other experiments I know of that actually have captured this data. And so, we have, yes, we, we are using that. That's exactly the purpose, is to really get down to brass tacks on understanding how these complex flows and what we call the roughness sublayer affects the buildings. Now, in terms of bringing this out to an informatics level scale, I'm not presently working on that, but there's a great opportunity for maybe somebody right here to pick that up and work with us on it. I'll tell you next week after I review an ERC on that topic. Okay. Time for a couple more questions. Thank you for your excellent presentation. I missed the first part of the presentation. Sorry about that. That was the best part. That's okay. <laughs> uh, my question is, you know, people, uh, practicing engineers are talking about the performance-based wind design, especially for high-rise buildings. What is your view on those uh, the efforts? And what is the, uh, the best movement, actually, uh, transition from performance-based performance seismic design to wind design? Sure. So. You know, the most important thing right now is that we really define the problem statement. So let me give you two, okay? The first um, is the increasing population of the coastline. We have to recognize at some point it's not going to be practical for people to evacuate southeast Florida, Miami, Fort Lauderdale, and go someplace else. With time, people will be forced to shelter in place. Therefore, the linear elastic approach we use now, where we assume nothing but cosmetic damage happens to a building, that's not going to work anymore. We're going to have to look at collapse limit states. We're going to have to learn from the work that's been done in the seismic community to make sense of that. This is going to become a very important question when you have literally millions of people that are going to be affected by these windstorms. The second uh, would be out, out here. You know, Five years ago, the concept that a tornado was an act of God was accepted. Today, that attitude is completely shifted, if not completely faded. We know that the highest winds are confined to the inner core of the storm. So we see a significant amount of damage that happens that doesn't need to. And with minor improvements to the codes, we know the survivability of these structures would increase significantly. Again, the linear elastic approach is not going to work here. We're going to have to go look at performance state design to make sense of that. Uh, how are you interacting with cyber GIS for this type of studies, and how do you try to push this information to policymakers to prevent people to want to make money with cheap houses in these areas? 
Well, we just had dinner last night, so we're just getting started. But uh, I think there's tremendous possibility to take this, particularly on that global scale level, with the, so using LiDAR data and other remote sensing capabilities to, you know, we're developing the functional relationships. Someone's got to apply that, validate it. This is a perfect opportunity for, for that. Now, in terms of policymakers, I mean, yeah, we all kind of live in that world, right? We do what we can. Um, I work very closely with ab advocacy groups. I try not to be the advocate, per se. You know, I, I'm more the person that brings the basic science or hopefully the unassailable science uh, to a group like Flash or um, to a federal agency that wants to make a point about something. Um, so, yeah, we do work closely with those groups and supply the information, but, you know, we're not usually the person in the front of the room when these things get discussed. Does it make any sense to, uh, to do some coupled modeling with uh, uh, models of computational models of actual hurricanes, or, is, or do you know enough about the profile that you can just change the, change the profile and, and test, or, or you know, the idea of just like take a hurricane simulation and just have, you have a whole suite of, uh, of uh, models of, of buildings and just see what happens based on this so hurricane coming through? That's a good question. It's my last question, I think. So um, it's a big question, too. So let me carve out one piece of it. So if you're looking at mesoscale modeling, the big problem we have today is the boundary layer parameterization schemes that they use to estimate surface wind speeds. Uh, okay, so there's that approach. The engineers don't do that at all. We run parametric models or CAT models. So fundamentally, we have two entirely different sets of approaches that are being applied. There's no reconciliation between how the engineer comes up with the load on site and how a mesoscale meteorologist figures out from what's going on aloft down to the surface. Um, and yeah, so I'm sitting on the, uh, I'm helping write a particular document, which you're all gonna probably see soon, that addresses some of these issues, um, and establishing that as a research priority. It's a huge one, and it creates a, a major divide between the engineering and atmospheric science disciplines. It's a classic example of where the the, the science problem is really interrupting the ability of two communities to work better together. Thanks again. Very yeah. stimulating conversations here, but I uh, do have to cut it off since we're over the hour. Now getting to the noon, uh, you feel free to corner our speaker afterwards, uh, see how much he could be around. But uh, thanks very much for joining us again, and thank our speaker again. Thank you, Kyler. <laughs>